Hello, folks. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast. My name is Roy Bensvi, and I'm your host. And I want to explain a little bit about the podcast before we start the show this week. This podcast is an opportunity for me to speak with some of the most interesting people I know that I can find on the internet. So either with amazing talents or achievements or just unbelievable life stories or invaluable insights into areas that they have dedicated their lives to studying. I sit down with these amazing individuals from all across the world. Really, I, I've talked to people from Slovenia to the Czech Republic to Australia to countries in Africa and South America, uh, really just all over the world. And I try to ask them the questions that will hopefully help you extract something valuable or learn something new or just get inspired by. And I do hope that you do get inspired by these talks with some sort of a call to action, maybe change something that you wanted to change for a while, or even just enjoy, you know, detaching from the world for an hour and listening to some great conversations. So whatever it is that you get from this, I do hope that you extract something from it and enjoy the conversations. All these episodes are available on all the major podcast platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google, and the rest of them. You can also find the episodes on my website, which is RoyBensV.com. You can find a lot of other information about me there as well, from photos to a little bit more insights into who I am, if you're interested. And you know, you can always go to social media. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. You can find me there. I'm pretty active on both those platforms, although the only ones I have, and um, I try to post regularly so you can stay up to date. And also be sure to, you know, put your email on the website. Uh, I shoot emails out with updates, news, any new current information that I have will be sent via those emails and social media platforms. So yeah, make sure you're in the loop. This week on the podcast, we have Adam Schultz. Adam is a professional adventurer and a best-selling author. He recently completed a nearly 4,000 kilometer solo journey across Canada's Arctic, which you can see in the movie Alone Across the Arctic. It's really great, great documentary. A lot of times when you look at these type of documentaries where it's adventurers, explorers, mountaineers going to all these remote locations, they say that they're alone, but Often they will have some sort of a camera crew, one or two people just to follow them. This is just him on his own, completely raw. He did all the the shooting for this whole thing. And it's really a, a really fascinating documentary. Uh, not easy at all. Very different than some of the other exploration slash adventure documentaries I've seen in the past. And that's why I wanted to reach out to him to discuss the movie, discuss the outdoors, nature, what his mindset is when he does these type of adventures. And Adam is just super chill the whole time. He's been doing this for so long. I think the majority of people, for them being alone for such extended periods of time, facing the elements, being thousands of kilometers away from any human and just in bear country and wolf country. Wolf are very cute, by the way. And I think that would freak a lot of people out. But for Adam, it's uh, it's home. It's where he loves to be. And that's why he's such a fascinating uh, individual and character. And that's why I wanted to have him on the podcast. A really, really fun interview with Adam today. So I hope you guys enjoy it. And without further ado, here is Adam Schultz. Enjoy the episode, everyone. The Genuinely Interested Podcast. Hey Adam, how you doing? I'm very well, how are you? I'm good, man. Thanks. I'm, I'm so glad this is working so far. Uh, we, uh, for, for the people at home... Um, Adam is up north in uh, Ontario, Canada, and uh, we weren't sure that we were able to have good connectivity to, to do the podcast, but so far, so good, and I'm happy that we were able to get it done. My pleasure. Um, so, yeah, so right now I know you're in um, Ontario, but is that where you grew up? Yes, it is. Yep, born and raised here. In that area, or did you grow up in like Toronto and then moved up north? 
No, uh, I'm from the country. So, uh, no, cities are not the place for me. I always consider it a good day if I don't see another person. I'm just out <laughs> in the woods with the uh, wildlife and the trees. That's the way I like it. Because Canada is pretty sparsely populated, right? I think it's like, as far as population, you rank like 39 or something like that. But it's the second biggest country. And everyone's kind of concentrated in the, in the south. And north, it's, it's, it's bears and, and coyotes and, you know, animals. Yeah. And a few yeah, I think it ranks, uh, it's right down there at the bottom in terms of population density per square kilometer, like I think uh, maybe three people per square kilometer total. But as you alluded to, that's pretty skewed towards the south. It's easy in Canada to go uh, wandering on foot or by a canoe for literally weeks or even months without seeing another person. I mean, that's something I, I've done uh, multiple times where I've gone on a journey and travel literally hundreds of kilometers and not seen a single person anywhere uh come across a single road or anything just you know vast wilderness uh, which actually i love about it i think it's it's pretty cool that in the 21st century there's still places in our world uh, that are like that yeah i mean there's even in the u.s i i don't think it's as as wild as that maybe if you go out west there's a few spots but you know even in, in new england where i'm from you when you walk around and you go on nature and then you go on these different hikes and a little bit of mountaineering because the mountains here aren't too big you'll still see people like there's never there's almost never an instance where you're not seeing anyone and i think that's the difference between like northern canada and and maybe there's other parts like maybe russia right there's a few other areas maybe in asia where you can go for weeks but that's that is very rare absolutely yeah i would say the only place in the us that's comparable is alaska um, where you can you can have those vast open spaces where you're not going to see anyone else. Um, sort of as you alluded to as well, I mean, we have, there's many national parks and things, but in, in many cases, when you go to those, um, even though they're nominally wilderness, you will see many other people there, um, which is kind of what I like about the solitude in the wild, uh, where there's nothing, you know, not even um, a, a guided trail or anything. There's no trails, there's no paths, just pure wilderness. That's what really gets my heart pumping. <laughs> yeah, I think that would get anyone's hearts pumping just out of, but like for different reasons. Theirs would be sheer fear and yours is sheer excitement. Yeah, I love that kind of landscape. I mean, in your movie, uh, which was amazing, by the way, Alone Across the Arctic, uh, which we'll get to in a sec, did you see people? I mean, it seemed like, I don't know, obviously there's a lot of editing, but how many people did you see, you know, across the whole thing? Uh, on my entire journey, which was just under 4,000 kilometers, I think I only encountered humans on maybe four occasions. Uh, in my book, Beyond the Trees, which gives a lot more detail than it was possible to show in about an hour and 20 minutes of the, the film, mm -hmm. um, I talk about you know my resupplies and a couple things like that. But generally, I'd have about a month in between sightings of other people. And uh, yeah, so it was pretty few and far between. And uh, how, how did the idea come about? For for people who don't know, he ba you basically, for the most part, canoed across the whole Arctic region uh, of Canada, right? Yes, mainland. The mainland Arctic from sort of northwestern Canada near the Alaskan border um, all the way over to the uh, Hudson Bay watershed. Um, so right across the top of the map of northern Canada. And uh, how did the idea come about? Well, I've always loved Canada's wilderness. I mean, that's my great passion. And pretty much from a young age, I've been out in the woods, um, canoeing, uh, camping, doing that kind of thing. I mean, that's always been my, my great love. And I thought to myself, you know, the world is a fast changing place. And it's possible that in my own lifetime, um, those, you know, really vast wilderness areas they will be no more. They'll disappear. Yeah. So I figured you're only young once. You only live once. Why not give it my best shot and try to go all the way across um, that wilderness area in northern Canada uh, while it still exists? And I really think that, you know, within the next decade, it wouldn't be possible to replicate my journey in the same way because there'll be um, roads open up there and things. And then it uh, kind of changes the experience. Um, you don't really have that utter uh, solitude that you would get in the way that I did the journey. So that's why I wanted to do it, you know, basically to, um, to live the experience and to see it while it still exists in that pristine or natural state. So is your fear more, um, 
you know, industrialization, human uh, settlement and encroachment, or more climate change and that kind of stuff? Uh, well, in the immediate future, it would be more uh, mining. Mining is what will really change the landscape there. Uh, mining for gold or diamonds or other uh, natural resources like that. Um, because to do that, I mean, basically, it's like building a kind of lunar colony. Everything has yeah. to be flown in there yeah. uh, because it's so isolated and remote. And it creates a pretty big ecological impact on the on the landscape there, and it disrupts you know caribou migration, uh, other wildlife, bears, and this kind of thing. And once you you know build a mine and something there, then it's it's a fundamentally different experience. And I don't think there's anything we can really do to change that. I mean, the, the pressure is just too strong for those resources. So. You know, what can I do? I'm just one person. I decided I want to I want to see it while it still exists and, and document it um, as well as I can, which is what I try to do in my books as well as in the in the film. And how long did it you know take you to, to prepare, visualize, plan the expedition, logistics, food, everything? It's a big undertaking, right? Yeah, the idea was in the back of my head for for quite a while. I think it was like 20, 2013 when the first seed of the idea got planted in my mind. Um, and then it wasn't until 2014 that I, I really started to think, you know, this is something I want to start training and, and prepping for. And then by 2015, 2016, I was well underway in terms of uh, planning. And I was frequently doing um, solo journeys in the north and long canoe trips. So I was used to solitude and surviving in the wilderness. Uh, but by 2015, 2016, I was really starting to um, study my maps and my satellite images and trying to just kind of devise uh, the best plan I could, the best route to get me across yeah. uh, such a vast area. And uh, so it took quite a lot of uh, prepping and training. I spent the winter leading up to my departure, um, basically testing out gear, accumulating all the food rations I would need, working out the logistics, uh, fundraising, doing all these things so that the time the ice melted, I'd be ready to go. So it was a lot of prepping to get ready. But but you were like that whole thing, like you you haven't done stretches of it before, right? It's not like you know, but like the Appalachian Trail, like people will do like parts of it over time. Like you, like all that journey was pretty much new, right? You've never been there before. Uh, it was pretty much new, except there was a about a two week, a two week stretch uh, in the middle of nowhere, like literally hundreds of miles from the nearest town or road. There actually had been there okay. uh, once before. And that's because, well, it's my full-time job just to do expeditions for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So I've traversed a big chunk of uh, Canada's geography on foot or by canoe. And there was, uh, it's just north of the Arctic Circle. It's uh, north of Great Bear Lake, an area I really like. I don't know yeah. how familiar people are with that, but I'd been in that section before. And I talk a little bit about it in my book, uh, retracing that section. But for the rest of the route... Um, it was all places I'd never been before, which is part of what I love about the North is that, you know, even if you live 10 lifetimes and you devoted every life to just canoeing and exploring, uh, you could never possibly cover it all. I mean, there's literally over 10,000 rivers. Uh, there's millions of lakes. There's so many lakes in Canada that even to this day in 2021, we still don't know how many there are here. The best estimate any geographer has ever come up with is around 3 million. Um, so... Wow. There will always be new routes. I mean, if you once you, once you actually bring up a satellite image or a map and you start planning out uh, possible canoe trips or hiking routes, uh, you realize the number of combinations you could come up with are is literally infinite. I mean, just millions and millions of different uh, routes and ways you could do it. So that was a big challenge of it. It was actually not so much the physical training, but just the mental side of things um, and devising a route. You know, how am I going to get from this lake to that lake to that river to over this mountain range? Um, because it's not like something I could just simply Google, uh, had yeah. to kind of come up with the best strategy I could, the path of least resistance to get me almost 4,000 kilometers, uh, from West to East across the map of Northern Canada. Yeah. I mean, and, and you mentioned the, the mental part, <laughs> did you have like a Tom Hanks castaway type of moment where you're like, I need a friend. I'm talking to a ball. Like when you don't talk to anyone for so long, I mean, that has to have, I mean, I don't know, maybe. Some people like it, but I think the majority of people were like, I need to talk to someone. I need an object. I need a human. I need someone that I can either really converse with or at least converse with in my head. <laughs> uh, yeah, some people. I actually, I love the solitude. I don't mind it. And I feel like partly 
It's a little bit different than the situation in the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, where he's stranded on an island. He doesn't want to be there and he wants to get home. Whereas for me, I'm having the time of my life. I love what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, of course, I'm not standing still. I'm always I'm always on the move. I've got to I got to travel as fast as I can because I have a very limited time in which to pull off this journey. By the time September hits, there's going to be blizzards and the rivers are going to freeze up. So I got to move as fast as I can. So for the most part, I was so busy um, traveling that I didn't really have a lot of time to dwell on things. The only exceptions are in a few places on my journey when I got pinned down because of ice, like, you know, there'd be ice flows blocking up my path. And then I might be marooned for a couple of days waiting for ice to melt or shift out of the way. Yeah. And that's when you really feel the feel the time and the iso- the isolation when you're just sitting still. Um, I don't like idleness. I, like, I prefer to keep moving if I can. Yeah. But yeah. no, I didn't have a volleyball. <laughs> well, the camera is kind of your Wilson, right? The camera is like a a, a vehicle or, or um, just a, an object that you can talk to. You can you know share what you're going through. So that's like it's 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 similar in a way, right? I yeah, I mean, you get to hear you get to hear your own voice at least. Um, yeah. And I I would sometimes uh, just think out loud. I, I don't like to say talk to myself, but I like to think out loud or talk to my canoe. So you know, if there's <laughs> someone else there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, before undertaking such a massive expedition, what are some of your biggest uh, worries? Uh, my biggest worry is probably not what anyone would think of. I know a lot of people probably think like, oh, well, bears, you're going to get eaten by a bear or you're going to get swept over a waterfall or you'll get uh, pinned down by an iceberg or something like that. Uh, but the things I worry about are that are actually a little bit different. The ones out of my control, like just some sort of freak medical accident where your appendix ruptures and you're far away from any medical help. So yeah. something like that happened, uh, uh, you'd be between a rock and a hard place because there's no way that search and rescue could ever find you in time. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I would worry about, just sort of freak stuff like that. In terms of the elements, the, the one that worried me the most is actually just the wind. Uh, the wind in the Arctic be very powerful. And when you're by yourself in a little tiny canoe and you're on the middle of a vast Arctic lake, yeah. uh, the wind can be pretty scary because it can make you know big waves, white caps. And even in the middle of summer, on those Arctic lakes, uh, the water temperature is hovering right around freezing. Uh, So if you capsize and you fall in that frigid water, uh, hypothermia is a given. And sometimes I'd have no choice. I mean, I didn't want to take risks. I would try to minimize the risk wherever I could. But, you know, sometimes I'd have no choice. I'd have to paddle um, pretty far from shore. I'd be like two kilometers, three kilometers from the nearest land. And that was just because I might have to cut across a bay or something. And, you know, that could be difficult. But, um I would just try to choose like the calmest day or wait until the wind died down a little. And and sometimes if the wind was really bad, I would actually sleep during the day and then travel by night because at night the wind would usually uh, calm down a bit. And that was of course something I could do because I was at the top of the world. So in the summer, the sun never actually sets and never gets below the horizon. So even in the middle of the night, I would still have daylight uh, enough to paddle. Oh, wow. Did you have any gadgets with you that would that would give you like you know weather predictions or, or anything? Uh, no, my weather predictions were looking at the sky and saying I don't like the look <laughs> of those clouds. <laughs> Old school. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, at night, you are completely fine with with sleeping. I mean, so I go hiking a lot here, and we have black bears in, in New England. A lot of them, and. I mean, they're not grizzly bears, obviously. They're they're much more, um, I don't know if timid is the right word, but they don't really bother you that much. They'll look at you from afar and run away. But I feel like the the sleeping part at night, right? Like you're in your tent. You don't know what, what's happening outside. There's noises all the time. And, you know, there were so many animals, right? There were like musk oxen, wolves, grizzlies. That doesn't bo- like bother you at all. You sleep fine. Uh, well, I'm pretty used to it. I mean, the first time I ever slept alone in the wilderness, I was like 13 years old and I thought a bear was going to come along and eat me. Uh, but I'm 34 now and 21 years of sleeping in the wilderness. I've gotten pretty used to every little noise in the night. Okay. Uh, it can be. I mean, when you have a bear outside your tent and you're alone, that that is always scary no matter how many times it happens. But yeah. you definitely get used to it. It kind of becomes familiar. Like with anything, um, people generally fear the unknown and 
it's kind of amazing how humans can get habituated to things. So you just kind of get used to sleeping alone with polar bears or whatever, grizzly bears, uh, what have you. And for the most part, they don't really want trouble. Uh, I can usually scare them away with my paddle or make some noise and they'll usually run away. Yeah. Uh, some of my scariest moments wasn't actually with a bear. It was with the, uh, the muck socks, which are like Arctic bison. They're these huge prehistoric looking animals. They have these giant horns and they weigh half a ton. And normally there's just gentle giants that are like grazing on the Arctic tundra. Uh, but every once in a while you get a big bull uh, and they can be aggressive. And uh, I don't know, with the bears, you can kind of read their behavior. But with some of these muck socks, it's just kind of like a you picture like a bull in a ring charging with its horns. They're more like that. And it's like, oh, OK, this is not a good situation. So there was a few sleepless nights when I'd have one of those come by and snort at me. and looked like it was going to gallop into my tent. That could be a bit nerve wracking. Yeah. The wolves seemed, uh, and I don't know if, if I'm biased because I have such a deep love for dogs, but when you look at, and, and I think you had like a similar experience, right? You look at the wolves' eyes and you're like, there's something familiar. Like you don't think it, it, it wants to harm you, right? But you have to kind of realize that it's, it's, it's not a dog, it's a wolf. It could potentially harm you. Yeah, wolf, well, I never worry about wolves, to be honest, um, because uh, wolf attacks on humans, at least in Canada, is very rare. There's only like two two known cases where like a healthy wolf attacks someone in the wild in Canada, which really? Really? I mean, that's very rare. Like you, you're much more likely to get struck by lightning to have a trouble with a wolf. Yeah. Um, in contrast, I mean, bear attacks, they're still rare, but there's at least like five or six in, uh, every year in Canada. So if you think like in the last decade, there's been at least a couple hundred um, or sorry, the last several decades uh, compared to just, you know, one or two wolf attacks. So I never really worry about wolves. Um, they're usually, they're usually a little bit skittish, actually. Like, they're curious. I mean, there are obviously dogs, so they're pretty smart animals, and they're curious, but they're usually shy. Uh, so if I actually make any kind of movement, they'll run away. Um, mm -hmm. But they're, you can see they're, like, looking at you, trying to figure out what you are. And I actually, yeah, whenever I see them, I consider it, like, a positive. Like, I get excited and happy to see a wolf in the wild. Uh, never, I've never even, it would never even cross my mind to worry about one when I was sleeping in my tent at night. Sometimes I worry about the bears and the mox ox, but the wolf, the wolves know uh, they're generally just kind of shy and will run away. Um, especially, I think in the time of year when I'm doing my traveling in the summer, uh, they're a little, you know, they're well fed. They're not really in any way desperate <laughs> for meat. <laughs> and fortunately, I'm pretty skinny, so they probably look at me and say, "Ah, oh, he's mostly skin and bones. That guy, he's yeah. not even worth the trouble." So they just leave me alone. Yeah, you're just an <laughs> you're just an appetizer. It's not a it's not a serious yeah. meal. No, yeah, they look. They look at the caribou and they're like, "That looks much more appetizing." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, out of all the things that th throughout the whole the whole journey, the worst by far seemed like the mosquitoes. Not even like a close second. Like I, I honestly, if anything, I think would have broken me mentally was just the mosquitoes. I, I don't know how you were able to, to, to manage the endless clouds of these blood sucking mosquitoes there. It just, it seemed like it just, it never ended. Yeah, well, it did end. I mean, they, yeah, a lot of people don't think of the, uh, the bugs in the Arctic, but in the Southern Arctic, uh, right around the Arctic circle, the black flies and the mosquitoes can be really intense, like literally billions of them, just storm clouds of them. If you go far enough North, it eventually gets too cold and there aren't any, uh, yeah. but where I was, there's just uh, billions and it can be bad, but um, I've had a lot of experience dealing with them. <laughs> and I just try to tell myself, mind over matter, ignore them. <laughs> they can't hurt you. Um, generally, if it's windy, they disappear. So it was often windy enough that they would, would go away. And especially if it was far from land, like way out in the middle of an Arctic lake, they would generally disappear out there. Um, at the worst would be when I was making camp. That's when you'd have like clouds of them. And, you know, sometimes I'd just be huffing and puffing from all the hard work I was doing. And I would like consume them, breathe them <laughs> in because they were so thick. But I always just try to look on the positive side. So I'd be like, oh, it's just extra calories. I need yeah. that anyway. So yeah, uh, that's uh, my approach. Thanks. <laughs> Is that because just like there's such a short, you know, uh, blooming time in the Arctic, right? So like the, the summer is so short and that's when they feed. So, and like all the flowers are out now, all the trees are lively and they just come and, you know. Suck yeah, it. exactly. And there's a lot of fresh water. I mean, there's just, a, there's 
uh, vast amounts of uh, ponds and lakes and they breed in them. Well, the black flies, they breed in running water. So wherever you have like swift water, uh, they're breeding and the mosquitoes are breeding in all the, the ponds and the lakes. And from about uh, mid, mid-June mid till the end of August, uh, that stretch, 10 weeks or so, the bugs are bad. But then after the end of August, it gets too cold and they disappear. And prior to about mid-June, it's too cold and they aren't around. So you just, those 10 weeks are a pretty active season for them as they're eating anything they can, they can find. Yeah, that's Which, what... what... I love I love winter, and I think that's one of the reasons why I just <laughs> I can't do bugs. <laughs> yeah, it's not everyone's cup of tea. No, no, I, I'd rather you know encounter some bears and wolves and and musks and then a gazillion mosquitoes that are just in your ears all the time. It drives me crazy. Um, as far as food, what did you, and I mean, I know you brought some along, but did you also eat some off the land, fishing, you know, um, um, picking stuff off, off the ground, off trees, et cetera? Uh, yeah, I relied mostly on my um, freeze-dried meals. Well, I had to ration everything out, so I only had one meal a day in terms of like something that would be cooked or prepared. That was a freeze-dried meal at night, and then the rest of the time I ate uh, granola bars or power bars or cliff bars you know, high calorie bars that I could just eat on the fly to maximize the amount of time I spent traveling. So I have to stop and prepare anything, which is probably something that doesn't occur to everyone is that, you know, it can actually be a time consuming process in a place like the Arctic to actually get back to land and make a fire. It's not like on the Appalachian Trail where you can just stop anywhere Uh, out there. You know, there might just be cliffs along the shore for miles and miles, or uh, there might not be any solid ground. It could be all muskeg or bog. And finding any firewood could be difficult. You got to look for driftwood or a little tiny Arctic willow. So I only wanted to do that at night when I'd stop for the day, which is why I relied on the power bars and granola bars to keep me going. And uh, I ate as many wild edibles as I could. Uh, the berry season is basically the month of August. I mean, you can find a little bit outside of that. But I would eat uh, lingonberries, also known as mountain cranberries, uh, Arctic blueberries, which are really tiny but delicious, cloudberries, uh, crowberries, bearberries. Any kind of wild Arctic berry, I would eat those when I could. Uh, in terms of fishing, I didn't fish on this journey. I do that on my other, like I do all kinds of different expeditions. Sometimes uh, I have time to just sort of stop and smell the roses and then I'll catch fish and eat them. But for this one, I was just like, no, I got to power through and go as fast as I can. So fishing was just something that I would do if I absolutely had to, like a, a bear came along and ate some of my food or something like that. Uh, otherwise, I was just focused on putting one foot in front of the other and moving across the map from west to east as fast as I could go. So just because it was too time consuming, you don't want to do it? Oh, absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, I can't stress enough. This was a race against the clock. So every hour, every minute of the day, I was trying to make the most of it. Like from the moment I woke up in the morning, I was go, go, go. Like, okay, I got to get out of my sleeping bag, get the sleeping bag rolled up, put away my dry clothes, uh, take down the tent, roll up the tent, uh, get it into my backpack, start portaging each of my items down to the river shore, get the canoe, flip it over, get it in the water, load it up, set out the 10 bars for the day. That's my rations. I'm going to eat those 10 bars throughout the day, launch that canoe, paddle, you know, have my map down at the bottom of the canoe so I can glance down, see where I need to go and just travel. Like in, you know, when you stop, then it's like another rush, you know, get the fire going, go gather water, get the pot of water filled, boil that water as fast as you can eat as fast as you can because at night I've always got some maintenance I got to do like some gear got ripped I got to repair it or I got to fix this yeah. and I have to look over my maps before I fall asleep try to memorize as much of the route for the next day as possible to save time so I don't have to fiddle uh, with maps or GPS as I travel and yeah it was just like not a lot of not a lot of free time the only time I would have free time is usually if I got trapped by ice um, but when I get trapped by ice I'm usually like okay now it's time to make up for lost sleep. So I'm just going to set up a tent and sleep. And then when the ice moves, I'll continue. Yeah, Cause like you said, like you either trapped by ice or there were parts where sometimes you think you're going along this river and then this river just ends. And then you have to like take the canoe out, right. You have to go over this river bit. It's, it's like, it's grueling work. It's, it's a lot of times, like it's not always just like paddling across the thing. And um, I think there were a lot of really hard moments where a lot of people would quit. I guess the question is, do you enjoy the hardship or are you just better at enduring it than most people? Uh, well, I don't know if I 
enjoy it all the time. I mean, certainly when I'm in the moment, I'm looking forward to the end. Like, oh, I can't wait until I get to my tent tonight. It's going to be so nice just to lie down and get away from all these black flies. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, the challenge is it's all part of the journey. So you have to kind of look on the, uh, the bright side of things and say, you know, this is, uh, this is tough, but, um, I'm getting to some pretty amazing and remarkable places. Not very many humans ever get to see, so it's all worth it. And, uh, I always tell myself, you know, it's, um, every day is easier than the one that came before, especially since I'm eating my food rations, so they're not as heavy and just kind of keep going, keep, keep trudging one step, uh, after another and slow and steady wins the race. So that's sort of the way I take it. Do you prefer to do these, um, solo these type of expeditions these types of trips do you prefer to do them solo or if you know if you had a partner or a team would you be fine doing that as well uh, i like both i do a little bit of everything i mean i'm known for doing solo journeys and i do solo journeys throughout the year mm -hmm. uh, but i don't just do solo journeys i mean i don't not some sort of loner who doesn't like other people <laughs> um i actually do guided hikes here in canada so uh usually every september october um especially for people who like my books, I, I organize these little guided hikes where we do four hour hikes together. And I, I limit it to a group of about 10 people. And I talk about wild mushrooms and edible mushrooms and different wild plants, uh, what's edible, what's poisonous and, you know, animal tracks and this kind of thing. Um, and I also do a little bit of um, school talks where, well, at least before COVID, sometimes they'd have me at a school and take the students out in the woods, teach them different trees and plants and things. And I always really enjoy that. And I do every once in a while do expeditions with other people. Mm -hmm. I just did an expedition this past September uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, the two of us uh, did sort of a, a expedition in Northern Canada. We were looking for the ruins of this old ghost town and investigating this old historical mystery. Uh, which is going to be the subject of my next book. So I like a mix of everything from solo to groups to just one other person, uh, a little bit of variety. I like, like all of it. There's pros and cons to each. I mean, what you do, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you really want to get people excited about nature, about the outdoors, but you don't, but you do it in a, in a nice way where I, I feel like a lot of times it's, it's uh, activism adjacent it's not direct activism right where well, a lot of people where they want to preserve nature they want to do certain things they're very in your face they're sometimes aggressive but i feel like there's another way to do it and people do it in all these different types of activism where you know they just do it in a nice way like hey come enjoy this uh whatever it is let's say vegan food right let's just taste that it. it's yummy or come enjoy nature come enjoy the outdoors and let me show you how there's a different way and i think i think people are much more receptive to that type of attitude Yeah, absolutely. I always try to be um, sort of low key in anything. I, I I don't really try to advocate or preach anything. I mean, people read my books and if they enjoy them, they do. But um, it's really just about about the journey and what I enjoy out there. And I know different people have different tastes. And that's, that's what I always say to, to each their own. Like, I love being in nature. Um, and I think there's all these great things about it. Uh, uh, but I know other people, it's not their cup of tea. And, you know, I have friends and even family who aren't really into the outdoors. Uh, some are, some aren't. So I just kind of think, you know, you have to find whatever you love. But uh, I, what I really enjoy hearing is when I get emails from people and they say, I randomly stumbled across your book. It's not a book I would ever read. I never go camping. I don't like the outdoors, but I actually really enjoyed your story. And I really found it uh, engaging. So that to me, I actually enjoy more than hearing from, you know, people who are really into the outdoors because obviously we share the same love, they're kindred spirits. But I like to hear from people who say like, oh, this isn't my cup of tea, um, but you made me sort of more curious about it because of the way you described it. I'm now actually more interested maybe in not doing a 4,000 kilometer journey alone, but actually just going out into the local park and taking, you know, a, a fresh look at some of the stuff out there. So that's kind of, I like that kind of, um, uh, comments and feedback when I get the people. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's that. And that's uh, to my point, I feel like that's a better way to get, to, to change hearts and minds, you know, show people the beauty of something rather than being in your face about something or being, you know, preachy or judgmental, just showing them the, the, the nice side in a very non-judgmental way. And I think people are just more, much more receptive um, to that type of, um, yeah, to that type of way about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think so too, hundred percent. Where, um, so I, I want to go back to, to the mental aspect because I, I've, I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, actually like, you know, adventurers, people who go on Arctic expeditions, 
I had Eric Larson on here uh, a few weeks back, who was the first guy uh, to ever do the North Pole, South Pole, and Everest in, in one year. And um, I'm always interested in mindset. You know, where does your mind go when you're alone for such a long time? I mean, psychologically, that would break a lot of people. You know, they, they would really, some people would literally go crazy from that. So where does you, do you go into like a meditation state? Do you go to have some zone or you're just, I don't know, alone with your thoughts and you're good with that? Oh, uh, yeah. I don't even really overthink it. I mean, I just sort of take each day as it comes and I focus on the task at hand. You know, I have to figure out a way across this lake and it, it's not always easy. Sometimes some of these lakes go on for hundreds of miles. You can't even see across one. Yeah. Um, so navigating can be difficult. There's mist, there's fog. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, I focus on the physical task at hand and I don't try to get in my own head and, and focus on um, or get lost in my thoughts. I just focus on what I'm doing, take each day as it comes. And I feel that formula, as simple as it is, actually works um, that I don't <laughs> try to dwell on things uh, like that. And uh, yeah, I mean, it keeps me going. Um, and I, and of course, I love, I enjoy what I'm doing. I mean, I'm, I'm making a, a record every day of all the birds I see, different species uh, of lichens and mushrooms and wild berries. Um, I'm enjoying what I do. So, you know, that kind of keeps me uh, grounded and doing what I love. Um, for me, I mean, the worst thing to be would not be out in the wilderness. It'd be like if you lock me in a room somewhere without a window, <laughs> I would go crazy <laughs> from being somewhere like that. I'd be like, oh, no, this is not good. Like, But if you put me outside in the wilderness, then I'm in my element. Uh, I'm doing what I love, so I'm fine. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's something you have to sort of adapt to. Uh, I started off doing, you know, small trips of a couple of days. I'd be alone out in the wild just by myself on a weekend, like, you know, maybe leave Friday after school and come back Sunday night. Um, and then I started building up longer and longer for a week then a month and sort of, you know, easing into it, just like with anything. Um, I think it's like that in any walk of life. You don't, you know, start off at the highest level. You've got to gradually work your way up to it. Yeah. That's sort of how I came about doing this sort of thing. You know, the, the, majority of of especially now in, in modern times we seek things that distract us from ourselves all the time right like you you see people go in line and the first thing they do is they'll take out their phone like we can't be quote unquote bored for a single second and that's why we we have TVs and we have iPads and iPhones and social medias and just everything to just distract us from thought right but when but you're out there for so long no phone no social media no, nothing to distract you from yourself. It's just you in your element. I think that's a beautiful thing. Like, I think people should do that. Obviously not to not do what you do, but even for a weekend, for a few days, just to try it out, to see like, it's almost like a, a digital detox in a way. I think people will oh, absolutely benefit like immensely from that. Oh, I think so. I think it's very relaxing. I mean, people are always like, oh, that's going to be stressful. I'm like, no, it's the most relaxing thing in the world. No emails, no social media, no news, uh, nothing. You're just on your own. And yeah, I mean, you don't necessarily have to go bushwhacking in the middle of nowhere, but you could just, you know, for a weekend or something, be like, oh, I'm going to turn off my phone and just sort of uh, chill out and slow down the pace of life, and maybe read a book and just forget about the world for this weekend. And I think that sort of thing keeps people um, sort of on an even keel and sort of uh, relaxed a little bit. Uh, it can be, I mean, social media and all this new, like smartphones, all that stuff is like brand new technology in the grand scheme of human evolution. Uh, yeah. We're not really used to it. So who knows uh, what kind of effect it's it's having on people's uh, mental well-being. I, I think like, you know, you, you sort of slow down the rhythm of things and uh, do what I do out in the woods and it kind of makes you a little bit, I think, calmer and uh, more, more relaxed. At least that's what I enjoy about it, which probably is not what a lot of people guess. They look at it and they're like, Oh man, that's crazy. There's like polar bears and whitewater rapids and big storms and all this stuff. And I'm like, Oh no, it's, it's actually, I like it. It's, it's actually quite relaxed <laughs> what I'm doing. <laughs> Such a, a Canadian attitude to it. No, no, it's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, um, I think a lot for most people kicking the phone habit would be on par with kicking heroin. Honestly, <laughs> like you would have to lock them in a room because we're OCD now, right? Like, like every minute you almost reach for your phone. If you're not doing anything, you re it's, it's just an automatic response that your, that your body has 
where's the phone? Where's the phone? Where's the phone? If you can't find your phone, you start flipping over the couch. You're looking everywhere for the phone. Like you're freaking out. I think it would be probably like the first couple of days would be very hard. But I, I think after that, after, you know, two or three days, you would, you know, get into a groove just like with anything else. It just those first few days would be probably a little difficult for most people. Yeah, uh, I think so. I mean, I never even had a phone up until three years ago. Really? <laughs> uh, no, I got my first phone after I did that Arctic journey. Um, I was 31 and I was like, oh, okay. But I still don't really use it very often. I, I just, uh, I actually find it boring. I'd rather be outside in the woods. So it's, <laughs> I just find that stuff boring. And you know, I'm like, oh, there's a wolf out there. There's a bear. Or I want to go find some like, ancient tree that's like 400 years old and, you know, all this fascinating stuff out there. So I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather be outside doing things than looking at my phone. <laughs> um. That's very interesting. So if, if people, so you have, I'm assuming a house phone, if people want to reach you, that's where they reach you for the most part or. Well, I have a phone now. I got one three years ago. But you don't really uh, use it much, I'm assuming, or do you? Well, I don't just casually sit there looking at my phone. If I use it, I use it in like a kind of a work way where I'm like, okay, I have to do that. I, I didn't have Instagram until 2019 mm-hmm. last year. <laughs> yeah. The last year I got Instagram. I don't know if you ever heard of Instagram, but it's this thing. Everyone I've kept heard of telling it. I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I hear it's very popular. Yeah. So I have, I mean, it's part of doing what I, because I'm self, I'm self-employed. I make my living doing uh, my books and my adventures. So part of getting with the times is like, well, you can't just not have social media at all. So I only have two social media, really Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And I just sort of say like, okay, that's kind of part of my job now is I might have to go on there and, and share some of uh, content. So here's a moose. Uh, here's a bear. Uh, here's an ancient tree. Um, here's this wild mushroom. So I do that uh, not not by normal standards very regularly, yeah. but I, I make it when I'm in when I'm in reception. I do it a few times a week. So I'm um, yeah, I'm, but I don't I don't let it take over my life at all because well, one I find it I wouldn't find it very interesting. I'd rather just be out in nature in the woods doing what I love. Yeah. So you do it out of necessity because it's it's part of the the job. You'd be happy, you'd be just as happy without social media, without a phone, without maybe a computer. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I wrote my first book, uh, my first book came out five years ago. I didn't I didn't use social media at all. And <laughs> if, if I could go on making a living just writing books and not having to do anything to sell them, that would be yeah. nice. But uh, yeah, in twenty twenty one, people don't really think it works that way. So. You kind of have to do do at least something to to let people know that you have the book, or else nobody yeah. will ever buy the thing, <laughs> and that wouldn't be very uh, wouldn't be very realistic. And then I'd be back to panhandling to try to raise money for my next expedition. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, expeditions get get costly. There's a lot of um, I think a lot of things that people don't take into account, right? The the, the food, the, the the just the logistics, just uh, whatever vehicle you need to to do your thing to get there. It's usually very costly because it's not like there's a lot of people going to these areas. Like it can, you know, rack up some bills, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I was used to doing expeditions on a shoestring budget with like gear I made myself. I, I had some of my own canoes. I'd build my own canoes out of wood and stuff and, cut, you know, fashion my own paddles. And I had just like kind of cheap gear that was secondhand. And I was doing these expeditions on a shoestring budget all along until I started to get sponsors um, from places in Canada, Canadian Geographic, well, Canadian Geographic Society. Um, but I still sort of, I, I still always have economy in mind where I'm, I'm minimizing costs wherever I can and, and trying to get things down. Um, yeah, but I mean, all that, all the gear and, uh, you know, getting to some isolated remote places can be, can be more expensive it's not just something that you do <laughs> with your pocket change um so yeah i have to find some ways and of course uh, i want to spend as much time doing what i love as possible so writing books or, or doing that sort of thing helps helps pay for it yeah you know when when i think of um because i i love watching like these type of documentaries and, and reading these type of books about exploration and about people doing all this um go either mountaineering or going to to the arctic or antarctica or wherever it is even greenland um but when i think about early explorers and how brave you know they must have been 
no GPS, much more animals, no set trails by, by, you know, trailblazers before them, not knowing what the weather is going to be with GPS and then all the other, and uh, sorry, not GPS, but uh, weather forecasting um, uh, technology, just rudimentary tools that they had at the time, but they just, and not even like, even the clothes they had weren't as good as, as the clothes we have today. Absolutely. Yeah. That's they still thing. made it. They still, you know, with sheer determination, they, they made it. Yeah, it's amazing how much technology has changed um, the outdoor experience. I mean, I, that's something I experienced just because I didn't have Under Armour and all that stuff, Gore-Tex, uh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, that makes a world of difference. Just something as basic as wearing Under Armour or any sort of like thermal base layer, it, it drastically reduces the odds you're going to get hypothermia. Uh, because it's wicking moisture away from your skin and it's, it's keeping you comfortable mm. um, doing what you do. So that, that's a huge uh, change. Um, having like, you know, super lightweight, waterproof clothing, jackets and things, Gore-Tex, rain pants, uh, neoprene. I wear neoprene sometimes when I'm walking through like Arctic rivers. Mm. And I think like, oh man, in the old days, not having any of this would make it a thousand times harder. Another thing people don't think about is how much canoe technology has changed. Uh, when I started paddling, I was just using homemade canoes I'd built in the outside in the woods, like out of cedar and birch bark, um, which is the way canoes were built for thousands of years. But those canoes uh, are very fragile. I mean, if you hit a rock with one, it's going to puncture. Really? <laughs> and you can't you can't just drag them like you can't just drag them over the ground when you have to get from one lake to another. You'll you'll damage it. But modern canoes are like almost indestructible. Some yeah. of them. Uh, you could like literally hit them with a sledgehammer or throw them off a skyscraper and they're not going to break, uh, which completely fundamentally changes how you go about canoeing. Now you can go through like, uh, say, a river that's only knee deep and full of jagged rocks. It's not a problem. You can just either canoe and if it's too shallow to canoe, I can get out and drag that boat right over the rocks and it's not going to put a hole in it. So it actually makes it a thousand times easier than it Is was in the old left? days. Uh, no, it's not fiberglass. So fiberglass, I've had fiberglass canoes. They would puncture. Uh, the really heavy-duty canoes that are made now are, are made out of a variety of different composite materials. Uh, some of them, it's like a Negro fibers and polypropylene and different other hard types of plastic, ABS, Rolex. Uh, but it's really hard, durable type stuff, and it's it's designed to give. So if you hit it on a rock, well, you can actually bend a canoe around like a horseshoe, and it won't break anymore. It'll just magically pop back into its shape. <laughs> Um, so they make canoes that everyone, there's even Kevlar canoes, um, which are actually, they're very light, but they will puncture the Kevlar ones. But that's for, again, if you want a super light canoe, they can just like carry over your back. No problem. Yeah. Uh, they have those as well. So it's pretty amazing how much technology has changed things. Another thing is pretty amazing is like the modern power bars. Um, yeah. How many calories are popping, <laughs> you know, just whip that out. It's like, oh, this is great. Uh, to stop and you know, make a fire and do what they would have done in the old days, cook up a meal. Um, so there's technology all across the board has, has made things much easier than it used to be. I mean, even within my own brief life, GPS has, has changed things. Even when I was a kid, it was like GPS wasn't a thing unless you were in the military or something. You had to use a map and a compass. Um, and then, you know, in 20 years, it just became an ordinary thing that anyone can get. And that's, well, it's a whole different experience than when you're trying to navigate compass or the sun and the stars so yeah it's pretty amazing how much technology has changed things and made things easier i think if someone tried to copy what like some explorer did 150 200 years ago but to the t like the clothes not having any digital technology uh food wise everything i think it would almost be impossible to do it nowadays yeah, I don't know. I mean, I try to, I, I sometimes don't do expeditions, but I just want to go in the wilderness with nothing and get back to the basics where I'll have my, my birch bark canoe and uh, just the bare essentials, but no modern gear. And I, I enjoy that, but it's not that hard because I'm not really pushing myself yeah. um, very far. I'm just staying around one area. But, uh, you know, what you just said reminds me of um, some modern people who've tried to recreate historic voyages from thousands of years ago, like whether it was Vikings or the Contiki expedition yeah. um, with Heyerdahl crossing the Pacific ocean. And it's pretty amazing when they recreate like those rafts or what have you, but I, I don't know for sure, but I think a lot of the modern recreations of that stuff, they still have like um, safety, modern safety gear with them, right? Like they have survival suits or they have um emergency satellite communications or even some stuff on board the boat so yeah. i don't know if anyone has done it 
100% legit, where they had no safety net whatsoever, no modern gear. That would be pretty, pretty impressive if somebody um, <laughs> set themselves the task of, of recreating that. I think I, I randomly read about someone the other day who was trying to recreate, I think it was in the 1970s, they wanted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean in a leather boat, like the oh. Irish um, monks used to do. I don't know. I didn't read into the details, but I don't know if, if they were successful or if they had any modern gear. But that kind of stuff is pretty impressive. If somebody wants to completely roll back the clock and not use any modern gear whatsoever and recreate one of those epic journeys. That's pretty impressive. That would be impressive. Yeah. Cause I feel like there's not really any firsts right anymore. Right. Like, or, or very little firsts left to be done. There's not a lot of summits. There's not a lot of, you know, pretty much all the big expeditions have been done. So now it's just, it's, they're trying to find new ways, right. Like to be either the fastest or uh, do it in winter or do it. Uh, I don't know. Whatever it is, they're just trying to find like a niche to make that the first. But we're just we have just we've we've done it all. Like we're just explorers in our DNA humans, and we've just been trying to explore and, and do these things, even when they didn't seem like they were they were possible. So yeah, it's interesting how that 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 happens nowadays. I just because every time I'll hear about something new where someone's doing it. But it's been done, but they've just been doing it in a new way. Now I'm doing three of those in one year, or now I'm doing it in winter, or just interesting. Yeah, you can always push things further. I mean, <laughs> the amount of routes, as I was saying, around the world are almost infinite. So somebody could do a crazy journey a uh, 100 different ways across Antarctica or the Andes, whatever, and keep yeah. upping, upping the stakes and making it harder and harder, or they're adding some novel twist on it. Um, I don't think we'll ever run out of those kind of possibilities if you want to keep pushing the envelope farther and farther in what you can do. Um, the way that I, you know, I think there was someone in like, Sweden maybe who rode his bike, Mount Everest, and then climbed it <laughs> just uh, up the stakes. I think so. I mean, this is just stuff I've read in books. Uh, you know, he did something like that, right? Make make it a little bit harder. Don't don't fly to don't fly there. I'm going to ride my bike all the way to oh. Mount Everest and then climb it, right? From <laughs> People are always going to Everest. Yeah, something like wow. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's um, <laughs> there's like um, um, Mark Beaumont. I, he was on the podcast, and uh, he cycled around the world in the shortest amount of time. I forget what it was. I think it was maybe eighty days, but I could be wrong. Maybe one hundred eighty or eighty days. One of those. But yeah, yeah. that sounds fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my numbers could be off, but I think it's somewhere in the vicinity. Um, what about you? Do you have any future uh, expeditions that you're currently thinking about or working on? Uh, I'm always thinking about new expeditions. I have many, many dreams of new adventures and projects and exploring. Um, in Canada, I'm, I'm an explorer in residence of the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So I'm planning expeditions for like the next five years. And they really range quite broadly from everything from looking for endangered species, like some rare species of bird or snake mm -hmm. um, in the wilderness in Canada. I do expeditions where I try to find them, document them, photograph them, prove that they live there. Uh, so I've done a number of those expeditions. I have more coming in on the horizon. Uh, some of my expeditions are more archaeology based, where I'm looking for a lost explorer who vanished without a trace in the Arctic 100 years ago. Or, That's cool. Uh, yeah, I do a lot of those kind of projects. Um, I do other ones that are just more about exploring and mapping a certain river where it hasn't been mapped before from like the ground. It's only known by what geographers call remote sensing, which is um, satellite imagery or aerial photographs. So just going there and trying to supply the last little details, the map. And I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll do, maybe I'll get uh, I'll get uh, a little bit stir crazy and I want to do another big, long journey. Anything is possible. Um, but yeah, I plan all kinds of different adventures and, and different activities and things I'm doing in the outdoors. <laughs> yeah. There, there's, um, the, the final, or one of the final scenes in the movie where you're getting interviewed, um, for some, I think it was like morning, uh, talk show or, or some, <laughs> yeah, that it, was, uh, that's a Canadian morning show. Yes. Yeah. And it's so funny because you, you look like how long does it take you to adapt back after being, you know, it's kind of like when you go on a trip, like for me, right? Like I'll go on a trip somewhere for like, let's say a month or something. And then when you come back, you're like, okay, it takes me, it takes me like a couple of days to ease back into the city life. And I'm miss and yours is just that times a hundred, like being out for months 
in the wilderness, no one around. And then like, they're just shooting you into a studio and you're suited up talking to people on camera. I mean, does it, it, it must take a few days at least, right? Uh, well, maybe a few days. I don't really have, time is not always a luxury. So I'd say 24 hours. You got to be ready to go within 24 <laughs> hours, you know, shave your beard and uh, take a shower for the first time in four months. And you got to hit the ground running because <laughs> obviously it's a little bit weird coming back and you haven't seen a person in a month to go back into like normal social interactions. But I just try to, you know, say, yeah, this, this isn't that hard. You know what? Let's, let's take the bull by the horns and get the job done. So uh, I just try my best to, to make it work however I can. Our time is up for today, but I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, my pleasure. Let me, we'll do it again after your next expedition, man. Absolutely. Yeah. You should have me in, on in the fall. I'll have a new book out in October. You might find it interesting. It's something totally different. Oh yeah. Well, it's kind of a wilderness mystery, like uh, Sasquatch and all that kind of stuff. So that's coming out in October. Oh, nice. Definitely, man. A hundred percent. We'll have, we'll have to, we'll have to schedule. We'll definitely do it. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. So yeah, in the fall for sure. I'll link everything in the show notes, make it easy for everyone to find your, your movie, the books, you on social media. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Awesome, man. Take care.